Good morning. I first want to say thank you to Tamanua for hosting the show. It's um, been a wonderful journey dealing with the staff here. Um, and they've had a great input into the curatorial and design aspect of the show and they've done a fabulous job. It's just um, been wonderful to see the black wall which is quite different and out there with the black table which is slightly longer, slightly taller and maybe a little bit Lewis Carroll and then the black wall there with the actual artefacts and it links to me um, having produced the show, it links, it links in so well to the portmanteau idea of you know two different compartments and I just think they've done a fabulous job of it. So thank you to Manua for that. It's quite nice to be asked to explain the show to everybody and the thought processes behind the work. Um, I myself don't know where it comes from. I find verbalising things really difficult. It's easier for me to formalise things in my head and just get on and make them and somehow they come together in, into some idea that has been sitting there for a very long time. Um, and I think probably to understand why I work in the medium that I do, it's probably easier to explain to you where my sort of sources come from. Um, I'm a South African, I'm married to a New Zealander. I started my life um, as a fine arts student majoring in painting. Um, in my third year I met somebody who was doing ceramics and I changed course three years of ceramics um, and it was quite an interesting course actually because in the mornings we did our academic subjects which were history of ceramics and ceramic science, a lot of chemistry and in the afternoons we would sit at our potter's wheels, we had to do that, that was studio pottery and we spent four hours every day producing domestic ware and it was a vital part of this course. Um, so along with learning to be a potter and learning the Bernard Leach traditions I was very, very interested in the porcelain potteries of Europe, um, Sevres and Meissen and Dresden and some of the English potteries and that was, became my specialty. The further along I got in my studies, the more interested I was in the porcelain and how it actually got to Europe through the Dutch East India Company. And the references to that, you, you know, it's just sort of come out in the work anyway, I think. Um, the blue surface treatment is very much from the European background and the classical Greek urn which I use is one that Wedgwood used a lot during the Victorian era where he was, um, there was a great, what's the word I'm looking for, desire to find things classical. I think they were discovering Pompeii again at that time and neoclassical was the word that was used a lot for that particular form. So it's been in my work for the last 30 years whether it was because I was researching it or it was part of what I wanted to say or you know where my work was actually going. So that's the background to my work so you can understand why I sort of work in the slightly historic, slightly strange sort of antiquities type of you know medium and the embossing and the adding on of clay it all comes from that European background that was my specialty. Um, when I first moved to New Zealand um, I used to paint miniatures of birds and I found this amazing book in a second-hand bookshop in Wellington and it was George Edward Lodge and it was a book that had been commissioned by the New Zealand government back in the 1800s. They wanted to replace Buller's Book of Birds so they asked this guy to paint all these water pla uh, colour plates and unfortunately World War I broke out and the project was shelved and the, the water colour plates were housed at the Dominion Museum and they finally published these watercolour plates in 1980. And when I came here in 1995, I found this book in a second-hand shop in Wellington and I bought it as a reference for these little paintings that I was doing at that time. Uh, sort of so over time, I started looking at the text in this book and I started seeing the names of the birds and I really just started enjoying what was actually in this book, not just for reference material, but just the beautiful names, the diamedia, to, you know, it's just incredible bird names and so that somehow had been sitting in my brain for quite a while and that's what started this part of the process. But before I get to that I'll go to barcode because that's really the most important sort of catalyst of this show was barcode. Um, I was working at Aratoy and I have been working there part time for quite a number of years in the collection store just housing artefacts and documentation, things that a lot of people would find very boring. I, I just found it fascinating. I 
loved finding what people donated or bequeathed. Uh, some things didn't have a monetary value, but they certainly had some sort of special meaning to the families that had donated them. We had this amazing show a couple of years ago at um, Aratoy, and it was the Wairapa Moana show, and it was about the people who lived in the South Wairapa and the lake, and how important the lake was to the people. And it was a show that was five years in the making, and it was up for six years. We had a magnificent waka there, and the whole community suddenly brought out the artifacts that they'd been housing at home, you know, Granny had kept it or it was in a drawer and we started getting the most amazing art, you know, artefacts and taonga that were coming into our collection store. And at this time there was this beautiful old shirt box that came in and it was one of those old fashioned plywood boxes and somebody had written on the top in this beautiful old handwriting, birds. And when we opened it up, apart from getting an asthma attack from whatever dearest dust or whatever it was they put in there, there were these four birds. There was um, a little pheasant, there was a South Island pukako, which is now extinct, and there were two juvenile hua. And they were quite small, they were smaller than those two mounted birds over there. And I was just so profoundly affected by this box of birds, it just consumed me. So I spent you know, a good part of a week just trying to get as much information as I could and realised that there was very little out there. I didn't know enough about these birds so I went online to, on Trade Me and I found um, Phillips's book of the Huia. Some old gentleman in Gaul was selling it for $70 and I managed to get it. And it was written by a guy who was working at the Dominion Museum. And it was published in 1963, which is the year I was born, so I felt it was quite a relevant year. And he was an academic and he had access to all the documents and information from the Dominion Museum and other museums and so it's a very relevant little book and it's got um, quite accurate, I think, um, documentation about the huia. So I started reading this book and at the same time I started making huia and they were very realistic huia at that time. They, they look, they, I tried to make them look as much like the birds as possible. And then I came across this paragraph in the book which um, was, a, it was an article that had been written um, as a presentation for the Canterbury Museum. And it was 1876 was the document. And it went about explaining how the huia skins were dried. And they basically skinned the bird. They kept the top and lower mandible and the wattle. The skin was opened up and placed on a fork stick, which was placed in the ground around a fire. And the tail feathers were always pulled back so they wouldn't get singed or dirty. And that's how they dried the skins at that particular time. And that formed the basis for me to make this work. I needed to explain what I felt about these birds that had come into the collection store. So I started just making them, simplifying them. They became um, an idea of what the bird would have looked like, not a representation of the bird. And then I just couldn't help myself. I just kept making more and more. I didn't cook, I didn't feed anyone. <laughs> we just had birds coming out of, you know, all over the place because I'd also been given the opportunity for a solo show um, at Aratoy after winning the Portage Award. So I knew the space and I knew a wall. It was an enormous wall and I had this idea that I wanted to make a barcode to represent that these birds were sold so cheaply and they were just expendable and no one really, they knew it was happening but no one was doing anything about it. And then I got to another paragraph in the book on page 77 and that's why there's 77 birds. And the paragraph goes something like this. There was an old chap down Dalefield Road in Carterton. And Dalefield Road is a long, windy road, and it goes towards the, the mountain ranges, the foothills of the mountains. And the birds were prolific there. And it was about 1907, and he knew that the government were trying to put some sort of strat strategies in place for the huia, and they were going to actually try and make a sanctuary on Kapiti Island. So they'd asked you know, people if they could capture a breeding pair. And this old chap captured a pair, he notified the officials in Wellington, he kept them alive for months and nobody came. They just never came, so he released the birds. And so for me that was a fitting place to stop 77 birds and on the wall there's 75. And two are always kept in the box as perhaps one day there might be a pair somewhere. <laughs> So that was, that was what barcode was about for me. And it took an enormous amount of my time and my emotional energy. 
and it was a story that I just wanted to tell for myself. It wasn't something I needed to do for any other reason, but somehow it just grew into in this big ex um, installation. So at the same time as this story is running, the Walter Buller story, this, this other thing was going on in my head at the same time, which was Lewis Carroll and his nonsense genre. And somehow the two sort of came together. One was a terribly serious, um, you know, orn ornithological um, chap, and the other one was an academic who just made up this nonsense genre. And so that became the start for these works, which halfway through doing barcode, I started working on the Conus avarius, which is a completely fictitious idea, but it's an idea of birds that might have lived that are now extinct. And actually, if you do a bit of research, there's an enormous lot of birds that are you know, now not here in such a short space of time. And the other thing that I was playing with with, with um, the idea of these birds was the mind is an amazing thing. You can take a bird's head and make a complete representation of it, stick it on a shell-shaped body on a base that belongs to an urn, and it'll read like a bird because the most important thing that your, your brain will see and perceive is the head. So the rest of it just is a bird because your brain just focuses on the one thing that it actually picks up on. And it's like, oh, that's a bird, but actually it's not a bird. So they, that was another thing that was going on at the same time. And I was, I was fascinated by this idea of making something that was completely, you know, make-believe. And, it's, um, and it grew, and each one of these birds has its own story. Um, they, um, I would have read something in the newspaper or it would have been a name that I'd actually seen. Um, for example, Diomedia Lazan, the one right on the end there, was um, an article that I'd read about the oldest albatross that's been tagged, and she's 62 years old. The chap who tagged is 90. She had a, a chick last year which she hatched, so she's the oldest known breeder. Albatross, and I just found that story fascinating. So I made a bird that went with the story. Um, Tura is a representation of all the birds that died on the day the Waihini sank. So they all have had some sort of reference um, for me at some stage during my sort of creative, you know, creative process. Um, and then we get back to. The um, large amphora here, which is the classical shape that I told you about earlier that um, I just carry with me all the time. It's a shape that I just feel really comfortable with. I'm getting too old to throw it on the wheel, so this is the last time that I make it. I just physically can't do it anymore. Um, but I felt that if I was making this fictitious little world, I needed to have some sort of historical references. So this was my historical archaeological reference to these birds that are long gone. And they're based on basically um, Archaeopteryx, which is the oldest known bird that's not a fossil. Um, and that's um, this one over here. Um, then we had Urvogel, where it was actually found. And then another one called Ziatinga, which was a, another fossil that was found in China. And it's, meant, it's supposed to be older than Archaeopteryx. Um, and it looks remarkably like a chicken. So these were sort of my reference points to make this work sort of looked like it had been around for a while. The ideas that were going on in my head at that time was I really wanted it to make it look like it was really, really old. I wanted it to make it look like it had been, the whole thing had been found or dug up or was, was something part of a very old collection. And then while I was working on that sort of idea, the other idea that was going on in my head was the half urns. And that idea started a few years ago, probably in 2008, I suppose. Um, I was sitting at my wheel one day, and always when you sit at your potter's wheel, the first thing you do is you throw a cylinder, especially if you haven't been there for a while, and you cut it open to see what the wall looks like. And so you think, okay, I need to make a mental note, but too thick at the bottom, too thin at the top, or whatever. And I was working on a, a series of apothecary jars at the time, and I cut it open, the cylinder, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. You know, I, I could actually make a whole series of apothecary clients. And so they became all these weird and wonderful little insect-like people that lived inside these <laughs> apothecary jars. And that was a series that was, um, became a solo show. And while I was working on that, I thought, well, if I can make it in a smaller version, I can certainly make it in a bigger version. So I started making the big urns and cutting them in half. 
huge technical problems. It was a nightmare, but it eventually, you know, worked out for me. And so I made those for the show. Um, after I'd made this, this solo show called Secrets Ajar, we had made 26 of these sort of processes and um, little, they're like little shrines where you mean to go and pay homage to something or, you know, sort of leave a little tribute or something like that. And I'd made 26 of them at that time and um, the one that I really felt epitomised everything that I was working towards, I kept back and I, I put it in the Portage Awards that year and I won. And it was, I kept thinking they'd made a terrible mistake, you know, when <laughs> they phoned. So, anyway, and, and along with the award came a substantial amount of money, which for me meant that I could buy a new kiln, I could buy decent quality clay, which I'd always been battling with. And it just was a, a chance to push my work to a completely new level. And it was, um, it was like having a, an epiphany, if one can call it that. It gave me some sort of feeling that I could just push my work again. And so what you see here today is the product of winning the Portage Award. And it's the last three years of, of my work. And I hope you all have enjoyed it, looking at it as much as I enjoyed making it, because it was... It's been a fantastic experience for me and my life's going to be a little bit empty <laughs> now that I have to sort of stop and think of something else to do. But thank you for coming today and, to, and listening to me. And